Tato. Hey, Dave. Hi. Hi. I'm excited about this meeting. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You know what? I I am. I've heard so many great things about uh, the Norwegians. Or uh, yeah, already a yeah. while ago, and I'm I'm pretty stoked that you got this uh, going. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I know Norway's been really strong, and and Park and Pipe. How have they how have they been in race and border cross side? I haven't uh, performance wise. Well, in, in racing, they're not really present uh, yeah, now, so but they used to be yeah. present. Like in, in the late 80s and the early 90s, they had a, a girl, Ashield Loftus, and she was mm -hmm. from the region of Telemark, and she won yep. everything. She was yep. really, really good. And she was the one that uh, introduced me to a young talent at that time. Uh, his name was Terry Hawkinson. And, and Terry was a superstar, and he actually... Oh, I know. I know who he oh, is. Yeah, you know all yeah. about it. Okay. Yeah, perfect. I know. I mean, he is the biggest. He was the biggest snowboarder of his time, of his decade, right? Yeah. I mean, one of the most yeah. famous snowboarders of all time. To, yeah. You know, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that definitely during that time where before the FIS uh, got into the snowboard thing, right? There was another association, ISF, and mm -hmm. they they definitely there was definitely a vibe that it was about lifestyle, being active, ath yeah. athletic, different yeah. things. And I wonder if that rubbed off a little bit in the rest of Norway too. I, I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. And it might be a question for, for Ivan now is that, you know, Norway doesn't, they don't really participate and they don't have a team in race. You know, it's also in, in another similar one is freestyle moguls where you have, yeah. you have Kari Tra who was, you know, multiple Olympic medalists, right? Yeah, yeah. They're very successful and they don't, they don't even take part in the sport, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, this is, you know, you, you think that their country would be really well positioned for it in terms of yeah. the venues and the hill size. And they don't even, I wonder, I don't know why. I don't know if it's a conscious choice, why they are participating in some sports and some others. You know, I think that the ones that they are in are so popular in their country, right? They sort of, they, but I, I, it's really strange, I think, that they don't do these. Yeah, it's so funny. I think it's a cultural aspect, like this culture in sport. Like, let's say when, um, like, okay, there is no culture present for alpine snowboarding. But right. let's say in half pipe snowboarding freestyle, there is, there is right. a big culture. Big. It's big. It's big. And, right? and, and, all and these kids them, doing this. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of them come to the U.S., you know, of those kids. Yeah, they're over in copper training, right? I yeah. mean, you know, I was looking yeah. at Horogmo, like Horgmo, right? I mean, back in the 2010s was mm -hmm. the, yeah. the I mean, really the one of, if not the best park and pipe rider, right? Yeah. And I think they, they continued with that. They have really high level. Yeah. So that's what they're, you know, it's not a big country. It's probably what the kids are doing more on snowboard. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting. It might be worth asking him about, you know, and yeah. just, um, if they're making choices on this type of thing or if the way, well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. 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 They put a lot of, they, you know, they spend a lot on these sports. Yeah. 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 I mean, the freestyles, the snowboard sport, they crank out one after another and. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 It's. um. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. I, I haven't, um, you know, his, um, Oyvind's background is, is really much more on the cross country side. Honestly, he, yeah. you know, it's, is a physiology research. A lot of it's done with cross country and endurance sports, but yeah. he's, you know, he's done work outside of that and become engaged a lot more outside of that and in international work as well, but his real core, you know, his background is as an athlete and, um, and research in that but i think he's learned a lot about other sports over time yeah. and the, the culture so we'll see yeah yeah i yeah. am i'm super excited and curious and we'll see yeah. yeah and then yeah you mentioned carrie try and she has the clothing brand uh, these days yeah, yeah. 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 Julie, yeah. julie's all about it <laughs> yeah it's cool stuff yeah we had um our team in denver we ended up with this incredible sponsorship deal with deal with uh Bjorn Dali clothing, which yeah. is the same parent, mm -hmm. it's Active Brands, owns Kari Tra, oh, okay. Bula, Bjorn Dali, Sweet Protection, all this stuff. So 
yeah. we had some of that stuff. It's really nice. The wool, like the wool stuff is yeah. great. And cool yeah. designs and yeah. 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 So we're we're the only ones uh, right now. Huh? Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, you know, hopefully the presenter shows up here. So yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'll keep my audio on for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'll stay on for a bit. Hey, Scott. Good morning. How's it going? Um, well, how about you? Good. Good. Thanks for putting these uh, events on. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. The one uh, that's at the library, that's actually a physical meeting that's going to be like later in the month. Like actual real in-person people meeting. On the 30th? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be neat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a cool space over there. The Olympian Hall, we have a smart wool sale that day. So that's the backup location inside there. So I thought I'd switch venues and it's a little bit bigger too. So we I opened it up to like coaches of the high school and soccer and hockey and everything as well. So yeah, and we we did uh, like a Zoom meeting with him in the last year. Yeah, we? we did one the last two years. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think it's stuff really, I really like like what he has to say. I think it's really applicable yeah so yeah super yeah okay well good yeah well i'll mute off so i don't make any uh, distracting noises but thank you for everything great thanks scott okay bye
Sam, how's the drive going? Ah, so far so good. I don't know about service all the way. It's, it's recorded, so don't uh, don't pull a quick U-turn if you lose us. Hi. Welcome, Ivan. Can you see me? I can, can see you. Me? Yeah. Is That's, that about, uh, are you, are you, what, is that the weather that? today in Trondheim, or is that a is that a recorded background? That's you know I'm sitting in um, in Engelberg in Switzerland at the moment. Nice. So uh, I have actually a research sabbatical this year. So my wife is from Switzerland, former cross country skier from Switzerland. So we decided to try to live one year in Switzerland. Great. How is it? How did the how's the family like it? No, we just started here, so we'll see. Okay. Uh, I still have lots to do in Norway because uh, yeah, it's um, it's um, yeah, I have a lot. I'm still leading the group, so I go back every second month to be there for a week, and then. Uh, we have almost daily contact with my project leaders. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, now I'll start interacting with the Swiss people as well. Uh, yeah. Be... Good. 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 How is your How is your German and French? My German is quite good. Yeah. Um, yeah. My wife is from Switzerland, so we I've been here quite a lot for the last twenty years. So. Yeah. We have some coaches and athletes going to Switzerland here soon for some on snow time. I understand the snow in the summer wasn't so good, but hopefully there's some new yeah. snow making it a little bit cleaner up there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope so. But uh, it's at least nice to train here. So I'm, I'm getting in better shape myself. Good, good. You get This is your altitude camp for the year. Yeah. So yeah. good, good. Well, Ivan, I'll just wait a minute uh, here for a couple more people to join, and then I'll do uh, just a quick introduction and let you go. I did just make you co-host, so if you want to share anything, um, you can... I have uh, a PowerPoint that I can yeah. share. Um, yeah. You can test if it works while we are waiting. Can you now see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Um, is it um, the big screen? So you see my entire presentation now? Yes, I believe so. That's, yeah. uh, it might be, yeah, it's always difficult. No. I don't see anything other than, than the slide. So I don't see like, um, it's good my size. Face. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can move my face. Maybe, does this work? Yeah. Ivan, for me, that's good. Does everyone else see that fine? I think it's a good size slide for me. Scott, Luke, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. Great. That's good. That's good. Um, well, it is uh, three after the hour on our side, Ivan. I know it's uh, getting later where you are. So, if you're ready to go, I'll do a quick introduction and let you start. That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's um, I'm ready when you. Uh, okay. Great. Great. Well, thanks, coaches, for joining this morning. Really appreciate it. Um, it's an exciting one. Uh, I've heard Ivan present before in the past. Uh, Ivan Sandbach is editor in chief of the International Journal of Sports Psychology and Performance. And until recently, Ivan was head of research and development at the Norwegian Olympic Sports Center, which is called Olympia Toppen. Uh, he's one of the world's foremost researchers on elite sports, and his presentation for us will focus on the Norwegian long-term athlete development model. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I don't know how you want to do this. I can take questions along the way, but then it would be nice if you, if they kind of write their name in the chat or something, or write, and then you kind of just tell it to me, Dave, because I'm... Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I and I can still... I can filter those while speaking. So if you yeah, yeah, I, 
I can filter those through um, or even no problem and kind of just write those down and ask those um, yeah. at the end. Here, if that we works can too. take so, specific questions along yeah. the way and then we take more general discussion questions afterwards. I don't know. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. And just and also too, just uh, you know, just a little more context in the background of having Ivan present to us. You know, this I think we're all aware of Norway's dominance of the um, medal tally in the Winter Olympics specifically. I've been it's really interesting to see um, the success in the summer recently with Warholm and um, with um, Ingebrigtsen, right in the in the middle distance running as well, and then. Um, and uh, I'm forgetting the name of the triathlete as well, who dominated as well. So there's something happening, I think, in Norway on the sports side, outside of the winter sports, too. And uh, I know you've been involved in that through Olympia Toppen. So very interesting to hear about that. And I know your research has focused a lot on cross country and endurance side. But I think that through your role in um, these international organizations through Olympia Toppen, learned a lot about uh, the environment that um, supports this success across all sports. So really interested in how it applies specifically to endurance sport and to cross-country skiing, but also just the Norwegian system and how that can be lessons from that for, for all sports too. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to try to grasp that. And it's, um, I can just start a little bit kind of, because it's always nice to have context when people talk so I can just start a little bit kind of who I am um so it's kind of I I, I was a cross-country skier myself um I didn't really reach the top I was allowed to try the World Cup a couple of times um but um I was thrown out of the team it was pretty hard in Norway so at some point I started coaching athletes uh, already at the kind of the end of my own career I was coaching some younger athletes and and I gradually transitioned over to be coaching some of the best athletes um, so actually my first senior athlete was a he was already Olympic and world champion so that was an honor when he asked me to quit skiing myself and start working with him so that was kind of a start and, and um Along the way, I did my master's um, uh, in, in sports physiology um, as an athlete. And then I, I yeah, I started working in parallel with uh, the Olympic, Olympia Toppen, the Olympic system in Norway, um, athlete support, and uh, in doing my PhD. Um, it was basically kind of trying to understand the demands of sprint cross-country ski, because there was a gap in knowledge and also how to train and meet those demands. So, so I was very lucky to kind of work with some of the best scientists in the world. Um, I had uh, Hans Christa Holmberg as my supervisor, and I think he was already then a legend, so that was, was very nice. Uh, and then I could work with the uh, national teams, first in cross-country skiing, they are often already combined, uh, where ski jumping was a different way of Com com very concurrent endurance and kind of explosiveness development. Um, they're after biathlon and uh, and uh, along the way also in other sports like athletics. So I think these pictures does exemplify just a little bit kind of my interests. I'm very very passionate about training myself, so I don't have so much time in the last 15 years. But uh, my aim is to exercise one hour a day. <laughs> Because I like testing out training on myself and being in such a good shape so I can go out and actually train with athletes and coaches. Because uh, being a scientist is, is one thing, looking at the data, but actually to really understand um, the reality that we're doing science on. I think um, meeting the athletes where they are actually training, being on, with them on their arena is, is very useful. So instead of bringing the athletes to to uh, to my office where I'm comfortable we I rather try to go out and run with them um, ski with them um, to see what they're doing how they focus and they are much more comfortable sharing their ideas um, so that's 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 my goal of training is to be fit enough to at least go out on the low intensity sessions and with them and I, and I think I can can still do that 
I've also written coaching literature for the Ski Federation, uh, also involved in the Biathlon Federation, um, kind of stairs of development and training philosophy, so to define the official guidelines that we we use in Norway. So that that's been been an honor, and uh, along the way, we've kind of been exposed to different sports. Zoom picture is with Olympic champion Levin Rudal in athletics, and it's been a close friend. And through him, I've been involved and got to know a lot of the our yeah Karsten Warholm. I actually published a research paper with the Karsten Warholm's coach like Ola Wallness. Uh, it came out on the same day he was world champion for the first time for the major hurdles. So that was was quite fun. But, um, yeah, it's been a nice journey, and I'll try to exemplify a little bit of my what I've learned, learned so far. Um, so I can just start by taking up this and this is from endurance it's from one of my pg students or former pg students who did much of her pg work on Marit Björgen. um it was the i think the most winning olympian in across all sports in, in the winter olympics and uh, she did some case studies on Marit, and i think when you interpret science and you interpret kind of different studies even also my studies it's kind of it's important to be aware that it's kind of findings on a group level over six weeks or even shorter it's kind of you should be very careful interpreting that into kind of a long-term development process it's kind of when you meet an athlete that is for example in the junior junior athlete and you meet the athlete here um it's kind of you need to understand the training history. What have they done before? What did they do as kids? What did they do as youths? And how did they build up the training as a junior? Um, uh, and also, of course, their personalities. What are their personalities like? What type of support do they have? Um, so that you can kind of build further on, on the good stuff. Um, and also try to on an early stage, find out what are the key measures that can bring them a bit forward. So I think that it's kind of, we need to look at athletes in, in these perspectives, understanding their history, not only of training, but who, who are they? What type of learning process have, have they gone through? How do they kind of, it, kind of uh, react to feedback? Um, Etc. Um, so that that is really important if you want to really help them um, forward. Um, so I think think this picture is is important, and also kind of when you read all these research papers that me and my colleagues are coming with, which I think is important. It gives insight to mechanisms and helps us to understand kind of the real world. Um, that's what science is about. But we also need to understand the context. So if you do an eight-week training intervention study, it has high relevance for, for what you can achieve in eight weeks. But um, what, what you achieve in 10 years is something really different. It doesn't help if you get progress in eight weeks. If it's kind of, it plateaus then, then you need to provide other types of stimulus to get a further, further uh, progress. And then I, I can say a little bit about how I think uh, when in the long-term development. I think uh, I'll focus on these two things today, but what are the characteristics of getting a positive development, not only in endurance sports, but in general. And that's what I will pay most attention to. Um, but it doesn't help to have all the success factors ready, all the you know, measures to provide positive development if you kind of if the athletes fuck up on an early stage, um, if kind of if you do mistakes, it limits the development or even is career ending. So I think kind of starting there can be a, a nice strategy. At least if you, even if you work with kids, it depends, of course, how much you involve athletes in this process. Is is of course um, is of course depending on age, and I assume that you have coaches working at with athletes on different ages um yeah but um but i think kind of being aware of the mistakes and i think kind of doing uh what i call a risk analysis um 
doing an analysis, at least if they come up to junior age, I think this is a nice way of sitting down with athletes and think about kind of what are the big mistakes that might be career ending or might be limiting your development. And it's kind of, kind of, if you do this together, you can look at what is the probability that this happens and what are the consequences? So if it's a high probability, um, it has high consequences, it can even be career, let's call this career ending. Um, then of course you need to avoid that happening. You need to put in a lot of effort avoiding that happening. I think this should not be a negative thing that kind of did, we should be afraid. So we need of course always to think about uh, how we do this and how we angle it. But doing this analysis might even be, be um, helping the athletes to, to um, be aware of what our, what should we focus on? What should we try to prevent? And if you get an honest and good dialogue around it, then, then you as a coach can also help athletes um, to avoid the major mistakes. And then of course you have some mis some kind of failures that are has low probability, low risk. You're just aware of it. I call it the green the green light. You're just aware of it, and you know that it's kind of it might happen. It's still on the list of factors. Um, and you now and then kind of talk about it to just check that it's not going in the wrong direction. But then, of course, you have these kind of the orange light and, the, of course, the red lights that are really important. Um, I can do some examples. And then I would kind of, when you talked about this, um, uh, that could be done kind of on a regular basis, at least every year when you do the analysis of the season and planning of the next season, because they are in continuous development and also at some point uh, athlete mature and even maybe trust or coach more to take up things that are, are, are a bit challenging to talk about. And then you can even kind of bring this is to some kind of risk prevention and treatment. If you take out the red ones there, uh, the red factors, then you can put in some prevention measures. So, okay, let's say that you have an athlete and uh, it is in a sport where, for example, eating disorder is a big risk. Um, the athletes had previous um, challenges with food and eating. Um, and if you're able to get a good dialogue, and maybe even have a specialist in, then maybe you can actually have this on the red list because you know it's career ending. It's kind of, it can even be, be, um, be deadly uh, if it goes too far because in, in many sports you have kind of an over, the, the percentage of athletes having eating disorders is, is higher than in the, the general population. So, so that might be just as an example of a, of a risk factor that you can actually prevent. And then even I've talked about it, uh, clarified what is the role of the coach, what is the role of the athlete. And then if shit happens, uh, if it really starts going in the wrong direction, of course, what do you do then? So you actually discuss that. And then as a coach, you start by talking to the parents, then you get in professional help because this is not something you could deal with as a coach. And then you kind of clarify the strategy uh, on an early early phase. And, and for example, as a coach, it might be that athletes don't want you to talk to the parents if it happens. Um, but then you have kind of an early phase when things were good, you all already clarify that then your role as a coach is to take it off with the parents. Um, and then uh, also together with them gets the specialists involved. So then you kind of, you shouldn't lose the trust of the athletes. You actually just do, did what you already had agreed on on an on a early stage or when you were planning. Um, so I don't know. I think, I think we've done um, some work with athletes that I was also coaching uh, using these type of kind of analysis. I don't think you need to do it exactly like this. It's, in my opinion, it's more the process that you actually are aware of it. And each athlete has 
different factors with high probability of kind of dropping into to mistakes. It might be some with back back problems. Even both parents have at some point. Um, just be aware of it. Try to prevent it. Uh, and if it happens, what do you do then on an early early stage? So, so I think it's kind of it's the process that counts. Um, but it's it's a pity if kind of you can't focus on these factors because you didn't see the obvious mistakes on an early stage. Um, and then I think if you, if you have a good process, because this is kind of in, in a long term development process that I talk about now, kind of continuity is probably the most important characteristics of success. So avoiding all these kind of stops and injuries and health issues or kind of things that might happen or that you train over train because some personalities has struggles on handling the training load, for example, and they sometimes do too much or with loss of motivation for longer periods, whatever it is. If you can prevent that, you can get um, a long-term development. And of course, it's just to turn this a little bit around. I think it's also, I think you shouldn't be too um, conservative either. Of course, there comes, if you just, this is, this is become more a risk of failure versus a positive outcome. If you turn this around and say, what is the risk of failure? With Because sometimes if you kind of are, want to come to a high level, I think, at least you come to senior level if you kind of aim for championships or for qualifications. There is some times that you need to take some risks, and then also kind of sitting down with the with the order athlete and say that if you want to go from good to great, we need to take some risks. Um, let's be aware of the the challenges with it. Let's so the athlete doesn't start taking risks themselves. Um, I had several athletes who kind of. Yeah, for example, who struggled to um, to sustain performance over longer competitions, and then they started to reduce their carbohydrate intake for a while in order to see if they could increase their fat metabolism and, and save glycogen until later in the race. Um, which, in some cases, on the very highest level might have some short short term effects and benefits but it has a very it also has a quite high risk if you do it you need to really be aware of the risks what are you doing now we do this together we have good kind of control of the risks we take um and we of course avoid all these red boxes because that's that's not worth it because it's it's a too high risk and you don't waste time on it but there might be some risks there that on a very high level that you take, but then to assure continuity that, just be aware of it. And if it starts going in the wrong direction, you can on an early stage kind of stop doing these things. Mm. Yeah. So that is just kind of my, my types of risk analysis that I think uh, often leads to a very constructive process because it comes up things that wouldn't have come up if you didn't kind of do a good process around it. Then I then I want to focus on what I think are the key characteristics of getting um, a positive long-term development. And of course, over time, as I said, you need continuity and you need that the most important demands of your sports must be practiced a lot. You need to train a lot over many years and you need kind of a gradual progress of it um, and you need to do it with a high quality and, um, and for endurance athletes for example I used to say that 80% of your training is at low intensity and if it's if, if you're not able to do it at the right low intensity and at the same time have a good quality it can be mental quality or technical quality then you waste 80% of your training time so it needs to be kind of practiced a lot and with a high quality. So I'll, I'll come back to that. 
And then I will focus on kind of how we can make training and competitions into a learning arena, because I think um, one thing is to be focused on what you train, the what, what is the training content, the volume and the number of sets or the number of hours or the frequency of training. And this is, this is easy to kind of put down in numbers and analyze, but it's kind of, I think good going from good to great, it's kind of it's how you do it. And it's kind of to make training and also competitions as a learning arena. Competitions is not kind of getting your rank, getting your time or your result. It's kind of, it's what lies behind. It's what, what can you learn if you did some mistakes? What can you learn from those mistakes? And it's always something good in competitions. What can you learn from that? And bring that into training. And also when you go into training, it's kind of, how can you make that a good learning experience? And not only kind of get the training done, but it should be the aim to develop um, athletes who are curious, who are uh, playful and actually see the training as an arena where they learn something new about themselves, about um, how they can uh, achieve better mastery. And that goes from kids, I think, from the age of five to the age of 55 or even older. <laughs> but I think it's kind of, it's so important to be in continuous development. And of course, at some point, and I even think you shouldn't do this, I'll come back to kind of what measures you can use, but I think it's it's fair to say that you should quality assure the development. These athletes, at some point, they put so much effort into it. To it. It's just maybe their, at least in periods of their life, their life goal. And then, of course, um, helping them to navigate, to take the right decisions, you sometimes need both objective information of kind of how are things going. Uh, but also as a coach, you have a subjective understanding and then using the tools to help the athletes to take the right decisions and quality assure that the training actually gives an effect. And then my last point is that uh, it doesn't help to have a good training philosophy if it's not aligned with your life. Uh, you need to assure kind of a life balance. Um, and this is, might be even more challenging for young athletes and those going to school, combining school and exercise and studies. And there are so many different pathways to success. In Norway, we have, of course, Jakob Ingevriksen, who is, uh, was an elite athlete at the age of 12, uh, which is not the normal thing. And it's not what science um, uh, says is smart, but still he, found his way through that. But kind of the more normal thing is kind of like, you can say Karsten Marholm was also good as a young athlete, but he was having a totally different life and was not an elite athlete at all at the age of 12. He was just playing around. Um, and it was much, much later where he really systematized his training and started to look into a future career, maybe at the age of 16. Um, and then, of course, when life changes, you need to align to your training and how you kind of implement training to to the to the to the life of the athlete. And at some point, you come up to a high level. We call it a twenty-four hour athlete, which doesn't mean that you should think about training twenty-four hours a day, but that life is twenty-four hours a day. How you sleep at night is important. How you, if you wake up in the morning feeling positive and ready for training, um, what you eat, um, how, if you have a breakup, or the athlete has a breakup with his girlfriend or her boyfriend, it's kind of, it might be such a crisis in that person's life that you need to totally change the training because it just doesn't work. And if they fall in love and they might, some days just lose concentration at all and get focused on training and others they for a couple of weeks and then then others they can almost do 
go go through the wall <laughs> it's so it's kind of we just need to remember that it's kind of we work with humans uh, and try to help them to get a little better in sports every day oh, let's start with this yeah Oh yes, yeah, so I think you'll if you'll get to. It, I just wanted if you had a chance to talk more about the the that development must be quality assured. But I think you're getting to it later. That's very we're getting to it. I just okay. I just start with start with this, the demands. Yes, perfect. I yep. think this this is something that is. I use some examples from cross country skiing initially now, but it's kind of this. I hope this can be implemented to all types of sports. It's kind of like. If I look at this figure, I just I just ask myself, what is cross-country skiing? What is that competition? And maybe many things that yeah, that's an endurance competition, and you go from A to B, and you kind of want to go as fast as possible. But if you look at this graph, it's kind of the elevation profile. It goes up and down. The second one is a speed profile. You spend a lot of time at very low speeds, and then you spend quite some time at very high speeds. And it's a speed range that is really dramatic. But then if you look at the power, actually the, the watts that they are doing, then you see that they have high watts in the uphills, and then you're even almost down to zero in the downhills because you don't produce any power. You just try to reduce drag and friction. When you sit down in a tight position, you still work. Do a lot of static isometric muscle work in order to maintain a low position in order to to reduce drag and friction, but but you don't produce an external power. And then suddenly you come into a flat terrain or an uphill and your power increase, and you generate power by using arms and legs, coordinating that in a, in a good way. And then you need to distribute your blood, not only to the legs, but to the legs and arms to compete for the blood with saturated with oxygen and, and carbohydrates to break down energy and, and help you to maintain that speed and this is interval based so it's kind of it's not as this sport for example cross country skiing is not a steady state endurance sport it's kind of the power is fluctuating up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down it's, it's kind of in competition it's, it's real a real interval um based um competition is not only interval based it requires very different muscle work it requires upper body work uh, lower body work whole body exercise in some part of the track it even requires kind of low static muscle work uh, in, in in the tuck position um, and there are terms and balance issues um, along the track um, so just being aware of what is this, and even if you go out for a low intensity session, it's kind of it's not low intensity steady state. It's low intensity interval training. It can the power is fluctuating up and down. And you can't tell the athletes to maintain a steady heart rate because then they, at least young athletes, they basically don't ski up the hill. You just need to allow them to have a good technique and ski up the hills, and then even they recover a little bit in the downhills, and then it's kind of it's it's somehow fluctuating. But of course, you need to, to, to balance the intensity. So the, overall, they get the right stimulus. If you look at this part, it's kind of the, the green is the aerobic energy where you have sufficient oxygen to saturate the muscles and maintain it over time. It is not like in marathon running or 5,000 meters. Right? It's kind of steady. And then the aerobic anaerobic component is increasing. So you are fatigued on the last kilometer. Here, you kind of you produce anaerobic energy in the uphills and then you recover the anaerobic energy a bit in the downhills and then you produce and recover and produce and recover so it's not only the ability to have a high aerobic power but it's also the ability to produce anaerobic power and recover so it's kind of it's an energetic um quite complex event and then you need to train at these things then of course you need to 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 be aware of that you need to of course train your aerobic capacity you need to train your your anaerobic capacity but also the ability to recover from it um you need to train um to sit in tuck position and this is typical for for my office where i have my office now i i look at the world championship arena 
uh, some, I think 20 meters from the finish line in the 2025 World Championship Arena in, in Nordic skiing. And I have, since Johannes was a small kid, he lives 200 meters from me. So I've known him from as a little kid. So he he's um uh, he done um when all the other junior ski or junior skiers were coming down, they were talking together in the downhills and then kind of standing upright. He was always sitting in a tough position. And then he was kind of coming into the turns, accelerating out of the turns, and then he took it a little bit slower in the uphills. So he was utilizing every situation to go down in tough position. And then he accelerated out of the turn and he went out and used kind of the whole body exercise technique. And if you look at that from a physiological point of view, what he actually did is quite um, unique because doing this small acceleration, it doesn't cost so much, but small acceleration out of each turn, that of course was a balance issue. It was a power issue. And he did it thousands of thousands of times when the other ones were just gliding through. And all these thousands of repetitions is actually what is his strength now. That's why he has been the best skier in the world. Because he did these thousands of thousands of times when everyone else was just gliding through the curve. And he went down in the, in the tuck position and not only did he then learn kind of when was the right time to go up, because of course at some point you you have too low speeds to take advantage of sitting down and, and, and reducing drag. You need to use your poles and get up. So you get more, more out of the poles and what you use for drag. But if you test this, on all low intensity sessions, on all moderate intensity sessions, when everyone else is just standing there, then you can learn those skills. And if you sit in a tough position in the downhills instead of standing upright, you train going down to a static position, then you go up and you need to distribute your blood to arms and legs at the same time, which is really a physiological challenge. Um, and all these elements is part of the demands of skiing, as you see on this, this graph. Um, and then you have athletes like Johannes who has trained that. He takes that into account in his training and he's really doing it kind of consciously while many others are just doing their training. They're performing their hours of low intensity training. And that's two very different things to actually consciously and playfully work with the terrain, training the demands of the sport and just doing the training. And this is pretty much kind of shown the same in skiing. You have kind of a given incline and speed, depending on, of course, all sorts of snow conditions. You use different gears, different sub techniques. And if you see how these are distributed, this is from classic double polling, double polling with kick diagonal, downhill techniques and herring bow. You kind of different terrains. This is the height profile. And you see kind of different skiers using different kind of, they have different patterns of how they distribute their techniques. This is done by, by some, some sensor analysis that we, we work with. And I think this is also exemplifies something. It's kind of being aware of where do we use the different sub techniques and what are the kind of the challenges, for example, if you're not strong enough in the upper body or endurance trained enough, you'll probably stop double polling much earlier. And then you train less double polling and it kind of your weak link will be even weaker because you don't kind of overcompensate this. So as a coach, you need to, if you see this picture, you should rather tell the athletes to, to rather either train in a little bit easier terrain so you can double pole enough if that's a development area that you find for that given athlete. Or you you um, you you ask that leads to push double polling up the hills, although it's not the most efficient technique at that point. You'd see that in a long term perspective, you need to develop those skills, and you should prioritize it. Um, and it it also shows kind of how if you dig into what are really the demands of the sport, what is needed to perform at a high level. And what are the capacity of the athlete at this given time? So in the long-term perspective, you sometimes put in elements that is not in a short term the most efficient ones, but you know that if you want them to succeed, they need on the early stage to start developing these, these areas. 
so so I think this is just just an example of how I think we should and this is kind of not the total analysis of skiing either it's just to simplify how we can break this down and then of course you need to break this down into sessions and define some key sessions and these skiers kind of uh, we just analyzed what we are doing and then we realized that for this is for one skier we actually had 40 percent of the key sessions were actually races and then um in this example uh, we had a had a skier who was kind of you know over the races then they just looked at the result and i said okay so 40 percent of your key sessions you don't really learn from it you waste the learning process from 40 percent of the of the key sessions because it's kind of it's just the results that you're interested in so let's turn this around and use each race that you compete in uh, test out different strategies have aims for the competitions do them in practice debrief afterwards see what was good what was not that good and that was something that really changed kind of the the um, the development because what was analyzed here was brought on into the long intervals to the short intervals to the sprint intervals of different elements of the train you didn't do long intervals to increase your view to max which i think is with the max is just a consequence uh, i would say that you should run if if you're not good enough in the long uphills you probably do long intervals focusing on uphills because you want to not because you want to better be at the max but because you want to be better at skiing uphill that's the demands. And a consequence will likely be that your VA to max will also increase. If you understand that. I think too many people they think that, yeah, let's train for the VA to max. The VA to max doesn't help you if it doesn't help allow you to ski faster up the hills. I would rather focus then on skiing, uh, solving the demands better. Um, and we have Olympic champions in cross country skiing on the male side with 72 in VA to max. Quite large skiers then. And, um, and we have males who have 90 in VA to max and didn't even qualify. But um but um, but uh, the the with 72 he really sold the, the demands and were good at skiing the offers anyway. And then of course, kind of consciously choosing kind of how do you develop the models, kind of and how do you optimize these sessions? So of course also a consequence of what qualities do you want to develop and how is typically is for example that you see for example young girls upcoming girls uh, during or right out of puberty they got a bit heavier uh, they should be because it's part of their healthy development and develop breasts and a little bit more more fat mass which they should and and then probably kind of eight minute intervals and long uphills is not kind of where they get uh, further progress in this period then maybe you can kind of just choose a little bit different something you, you do a little bit more of the intervals in easy terrain so they can get a good feeling that actually because they can get stronger um, or powerful and ski with better technique and in easy terrain, maybe you put some of the tests and some of the sessions in easy terrain. Then, if you go in off hills and you see that ah, these eight min minute intervals in the steep up hills, it goes too slow. The technique is not good, and it's kind of doesn't uh, it doesn't seem like a good muscular uh, effort. Uh, do you forty five minutes um, break them up into forty five second uh, second intervals with 15 second breaks they will have still have the high heart rate they can still do the same work and they get a much better feeling out of it so this is kind of how you can play around with sessions um not because eight minutes is important but because you you see that how can they develop the technique their physiology and have a decent load on the session and design sessions that are really helping them to to develop what they should develop and, and of course i think this applies very much to this uh, at the in endurance sport and i think in other sports as well you do a lot of these basic stuff that you can do a lot of um and then just ask ask that why, why are you doing this training what is your goal on this training session and then how should we do it 
what should we have focus on in this session? So it's kind of it's goal oriented and uh, maybe even fun to do it. You're not just going out there to do the session, you're out there to really develop the skill, um, learn something new. you do more than maybe do three or four strength sessions a week and an endurance athlete you maybe do it two times a week in the build up and you maintain it so having a focus on when do you build up strength when you, how do you do maintain strength because strength is always just a tool strength at least if you're not a weightlifter strength is never a goal strength is a tool to develop your sport and of course, then you need to do these analysis, kind of you need to individualize it. Why do you want to develop strength? Is it because you want to be faster at some point? Is it because you want your technique to be more robust or better? Is it because you want to maintain your efficiency or economy over time? Is it to delay fatigue? Because if you're stronger and you get fatigued, then your root goes a little bit down because it can't produce and then having kind of a little bit over capacity on strength might sometimes delay fatigue uh, because you it takes longer before you come to a level where fatigue is really limiting your performance uh, and then they're having a movement specific and also you know, how can you use this to transfer your energy into movement and, and power but just having that mindset how can this help me to help this individual athletes to improve the movements in the specific sports and solve the goal of the session. What is the goal of this session? Which is probably different for a young athlete compared to a more advanced athlete. Same applies if you do speed training. It's kind of being aware, it's kind of would you want to develop something in the rest of state, your acceleration, your maximum speed, or at some point, you maybe want them to be able to do it in a fatigue state, do a tax or a fitness sprint or whatever. Um, and then kind of be very aware of building up the sessions of kind of what are we targeting uh, at this point and in a long term perspective. And of course, if you want to, to continue this training over time, you, you need to have a system for health prevention. Um, and then injury, kind of an early stage, you kind of find out. Kind of, that's why I think this risk analysis is smart because injury prevention exercise on early stage, putting it in as a part of the warm up is is um, is extremely helpful. And prevention that might allow people to to succeed with their career. Um, injury treatment is normally the start of the end. So. So that is that is extremely important to uh, that's why I introduced those analysis because for an endurance athlete it might kind of be or a winter athlete at least it might be asthma for example we know that kind of the prevalence of asthma in, in skiers and biathletes it's kind of goes like this throughout the career and if you don't are not aware of kind of when you let the kids train and what is kind of training stop and when do you are you pushing them into a competition at 20 minus degrees or do you say that kind of with 15 degrees we don't take the chance anymore it's kind of it's too high chance i think very clear rules for that is in my opinion might help people to have a better career but also uh, to be healthy after the career um that, that's just just some, some examples. And of course, it's kind of putting this all together is kind of where you go from science to art. There's, um, that's the fun of it. It's kind of trying to find out kind of how can you puzzle together the different components, put together the, the speed sessions, the strength sessions, the endurance sessions, so they interplay in a good way. Some athletes, they feel that after a strength session, they are so mobilized, they have so good muscles that going out to do the 
high intensity sessions are very good then other athletes they get too much tension in their muscles and, and the high intensity session is not good at all so it's good that there are individual differences also sport specific differences but finding this way of puzzling it together is kind of is really cool um, and you can find out different ways of how to to balance this it, it's um, and how it's, it's like playing chess it's kind of what do you do in this the next step probably what what is the best solution in the next step is probably not the best in the long term so it's kind of when you play chess a good chess player they think 10 steps ahead because you know what you do on the training today that would influence the afternoon session it would again influence the, the, the tomorrow morning session and then the afternoon session and then along the way it's kind of it has an accumulative effect on the upcoming session so if you're a good chess player then you puzzle this together in a way that you get good sessions out of it but it also playing the next session good and the next session good and when you really push it then you have a, a rest day afterwards so kind of finding this kind of balance always keeping in mind that you want to optimize the adaptation is is really important yeah and this is just kind of a summary is kind of you need high quality specific training individual targeting and of course fine-tuning these skills in response to feedback it's kind of it's reflective exploration and it provides repetitions with where you continuously learn uh, along the way and and if you want to motivate kind of the athletes to succeed in my opinion um it must be driven by passion you need to do this in a way that is it's like what I tell my PhD students when we start working with them. And then I say to them that we need to develop a process that when you are finished with your PhD, you have your degree, you've learned a lot, but you're much you're more passionate than ever because getting a PhD, who cares? But getting a PhD allows you to be a passionate researcher and work with science or utilize science for the rest of your life. And I think it's the same with the athletes. It needs to be driven by passion and it's sustained by health. Um, because you need 10, 15 years to take out the full potential. And if they see along the way that they're not as good as they hope to, at least they can have fun. They can be part of the team. They can use activity um, for the rest of their life. And probably they learn a lot. Kind of just working toward the goals and and learning about yourself about the process and i think that's something you can bring with you for in, in kind of whatever you will do for the rest of your life and then i come to this which is kind of what i want people to bring with them and what i think most people can learn from is giving kind of getting this into being a, a explorative learning arena and if we kind of just simplify it kind of what counts you should hunt for the good sessions execution is what counts uh, what you do on the field is what counts but if i can use an example from when i was coaching when i was a student 20 years ago and i was coaching kids um, to pay my salary for my housing uh with young kids and then it's kind of, I worked, I didn't know it by then, but I, I see it now. I worked exactly the same way with the kids as I do with the elite athletes now. It's just the kids that didn't know it because I wanted to have extremely good sessions for them. And it was just play, we played on skis. Um, but I wanted them to learn something more new every time to develop their skills, to feel mastery and have fun. So the kind of execution was so important. Um, and then I had to involve the athletes in that. So what we did was we had before every session, um, I had of course planned my sessions. So and then we sat down with the kids just for some minutes. And I said, yeah, did you, do you now remember what we planned last time? What, what should we do today? And then some of them remember. 
Okay, what should be the goal of today's session then? Okay, it's as high speed out of the curve as possible. Okay, uh, that's the goal today. Um, and then, then I told them quickly what they're going to do. So they kind of were prepared. So I didn't, I didn't need to talk too much. And then we agreed on how we should give feedback. Two minutes, we went out. And of course you had prepared um, for a good session. And then if we only give feedback on the goal of the session, we don't come with all types of feedback. We just give them, give them uh, feedback on what has been agreed on in the preparation. And and uh, mostly positive feedback, what is good, or maybe some tips of how they can do even better. Then, of course, after the session, you just stop, let's go into the cabin uh, at the stadium. And then you tell them, oh, even though they're young, I, I assume you brought a dry shirt so you don't go sit in the car or sweat, just to stop teaching them that change, change your shirt. Uh, so you learn that. Did, did you grab, did you have some food and something to drink after the session? And if, if they don't, uh, of course, they kind of remember that until next time, and then they'll bring, they'll bring, their, uh, bring their food and their drink for, for the next time. And then you ask them, how did it go today? Did anyone, how did it feel when you kind of got a good speed out of the terms? And then they tell, and they tell each other what they did and what they learned and what worked well and what didn't work so well. And then, of course, you kind of ask them, what should we do next time then? Do you have any ideas of how we should do on Thursday? And I think this creates learning. They are involved in the process. They have ownership in what you do on the training sessions. They learn, and you as a coach, you can learn from them. And you can adjust the training plan better, and then you involve them in the preparation. And this, if you do this together, you will become a better coach because you learn from the athletes. You involve the athletes so they have ownership in the process, and you actually facilitate a lot of learning because what they really do is what you see in research is defining good performance in music, in business, in, in, in whatever field you are in before kind of a training or a meeting or uh, for a musician. There, it's very clear what, what is the goal for this session. What specifically should I improve today? That should be crystal clear before every training. It's not complex. You can do it with kids, you can do it with grown ups, but it needs to be crystal clear for you as a coach and for the athletes. During the session, you just do the work, you're present. And if you give feedback, it's feedback toward the goals that have been set and aligned with athletes. And you're just checking Am I doing what I'm set out to do today? And then you, you debrief, just kind of learning the athletes to ask themselves these questions. How did I carry out the training according to the goal of the session? And what can I do better next time? And I think that's kind of very easy, kind of, that you actually make training. And of course, you should do this in a competition as well, because the result is in the long term not very important. Uh, what is important is the process. And, what you learned. And if you do this over time, this is how the athletes will start thinking. And it's, it's you as a coach who is really the core of developing such a culture. And then I'll just kind of say a little bit about testing. I think having objective information, at least on junior age, is smart. Use your watch, have standard sessions, Testing, you, you don't have to go into the lab. I'm lucky to have a lab around me or use all types of technology. It can be simple, training diaries, training logs, taking time and measuring length, doing the simple things and building up your kind of, uh, your, your platform of data. So you know what, what, how, how is your shape? Um, uh, how are things progressing? And, and um, of course, getting data when things are good is important because if it doesn't go well, then you have a database of how things should. Information from the athlete's perspective and really understand what did the athlete feel 
what did they think about and align that with your objective information, you can kind of use that as a calibration tool. And, and it's really an important part of the, the learning process. And as a coach, of course, providing positive feedback when something is good, that's the key. Giving people a thumb up when things are good, that's so important. The negative feedback probably doesn't help much, but also giving positive feedback when it doesn't feel good. That then you just lose integrity among the athletes because they think, yeah, they're just giving feedback for giving feedback. You should give positive feedback when something is good. And then if you if you really have collected objective information over time, so you can start seeing when things are good, and you actually have objective numbers of when it's good, and you actually ask the athlete when is the athlete feeling good. You learn about the athlete, you learn about the execution, and you can actually learn yourself to provide this essential feedback uh, positively when it's really good. So that's one effect. And the other effect is, of course, that you control the training effect because it's kind of correct training gives an adaptation. And it's kind of you balance high quality work with recovery, you get an adaptation from it, at least up to a certain stage. And that's a very high level if the athletes have kind of taken out their potential. So, so I think it's kind of managing kind of how to constantly adapt the quality and the content of the training and being aware of kind of did they sleep and did they recover well to get an adaptation. At least you get a number of it. And it can be done very easily. So this is the more advanced part when you kind of it's just running at different speeds. This is a 10% incline, it's from Marit Björgin. When it kind of she had a certain lactate, or you can measure if you have heart rate, or if you have kind of just a Borg scale rating from one to ten. It just gives you an indication kind of, of how you're responding to a certain activity. As in strength athletes, you can go to the gym and see what you lift. Uh, uh, and it's it just helps you to on a daily basis to get confidence that you get an effect. And then of course, I think um, if you really want to succeed as a coach, and, and it's not only about results, it's kind of how people do. Create an environment where people are passionate, people um, are developing as athletes. And I think in, in that process, you might even get super athletes because I think that passion can bring you to the highest level. Um, and then I think an important question to ask now then is not only how do you do, but how do you really do? Um, and being aware that these are humans, it's kind of their life stress is, of course, their training, their physical stress, but it's also cognitive stress, school and work and all these type of things, but also the emotional stress. And, and we have our resilience towards different types of stress. It's very be different. Uh, I have, for example, an extremely high level of cognitive stress. Um, I can work a lot cognitively. Probably that's why I work as a university professor. Um, but I'm not very strong in emotional part. So if my kids are sick or my wife is angry at me, it's kind of, it tears me down. <laughs> I'm not so tough. Uh, and just being aware of how these different types of stresses impact in me is kind of helps you to manage your life. And, and I think this is something that athletes need to learn. And then they need to adapt their training or sometimes adapt their stress. If it's a lot of physical stress, they can't have the same cognitive stress as they have. So it's kind of you need to make sure these things are in balance uh, so that you can get get an effect out of your training and you can not always stress. So it's kind of being an athlete is also the ability to organize your life 24 hours a day. Sorry, I forgot to change this to it's just emotional, cognitive, physical stress, which is total stress level you have over 24 hours. Um, 
And um, in the end, you work with, I, I used to say, kind of coaching is working, is developing humans um, to take out their potential, um, trying to reach their goal, which is such a, such a useful learning process um, for the rest of your life, but it's also fun. Um, and um, and um, it's also, it's not only about doing your training correct, but also how to organize your life to, to reach those goals. And I think that can be an important part of, of um, developing humans. So that's it. Was it uh, something to take out of it? Certainly, Oyvind. Thank you very much. I really liked uh, the framework, uh, the four elements, thinking about that. I think that applies universally in sport, um, especially above a certain age, I think. And um, I can certainly see how uh, that applies to athletes that I've worked with. I'm, I'm curious what the thoughts of our coaches are, if there are any specific questions there too. But thank you very much. That was very, very interesting for me and some, some very specific things that I can see to apply. Thank you. Thank you. And I think if there are any questions, you can just unmute and um, and ask people out there. I can then ask you what type of sports are you do you have in your we have uh, quite quite a few so i believe here we'll, we'll have um ski jumping and nordic combined cross country alpine snowboarding um free skiing and and freestyle are all present here um which is really all the all of the disciplines in the in the club in addition to the sub disciplines within some of those too so yeah quite broad yeah Cool. Are you also facilitating a bit learning across sports? Kind of. I think that's something when working in Olympia and that was really cool for me. It was kind of sitting down with the ski jumpers or 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 the high jumpers in athletics or those uh, training for pole walls. It's kind of it's kind of how they develop technique, how they think, how they do. Um, it's kind of it's really. It's so much to learn across sports. I think the general principles of performance development is kind of that's it's kind of unique potential you have in your club to really help each other. That's good advice. It's something we haven't done a lot of. I remember from uh, I have a collegiate background, which is you know even more broad range of sports, and that's something that we did there. We you just see it a lot, right? You see each sport has something to teach everybody else, right? Every sport is um in their training or their competition they're they're the best at something or the way they do it their process their focus that another sport could learn from right you know so you see it when you're in the weight room you see what the the hockey players are doing you go we can we can learn from that you know and then they see something uh, that the cross-country skiers the alpine skiers are doing for core strength and they say that's we can learn from that too so we did that there more i think it's something that we could certainly do more at our club too. Yeah, it's, it's it's quite diverse, even though it's just no sports. Yeah. Yeah, it's just to, motiv to motivate a bit your coaches there because I think it's kind of, I think it's so much potential in it. Um, just kind of join a session from another sport where they are really good and see kind of how are they doing it and, and um, what can you take out of it and bring it into your own. And also if you have some athletes that are extremely good kind of, it's sometimes too easy to talk about what you're doing, but how are you doing it to really see it kind of is something I think is so, uh, so interesting. Yeah. And something, one question I have, Ivan, was um, you talked about you know, the importance of motivation and passion and in, in developing that. And um, it's something I'm really interested in. And I think it's, it's a sort of fundamental foundational thing, both for athletes and for coaches that you have that motivation that you bring that that's a determinant of success, right? How motivated you are. Do you, have you come across, you know, many um, 
guidelines for a process or practices that help teams and individuals to um, develop and maintain that that passion, that motivation? I know it's outside the realm of sports science. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not but, my core yeah. expertise as yeah. a scientist, but, yeah. but I can say, for example, we are we are uh, writing a book now on where I have an editor of a book where we try to kind of grasp psychology also and how we can use psychology to to um, develop a good performance culture. And I think that's part of developing this passion, this motivation, and and of course. Um, I think what I see is kind of you should really involve the athletes in the process, uh, and I think kind of seeing the athletes as a resource. You don't, as a coach, come and tell the athletes what to do. Um, that's at least you don't start. Sometimes you need to do that in order to get the session done. But kind of involving athletes in the process of planning. Uh, and also making it as a learning process, not you as a coach telling them every day what they do and what they did right and wrong, but actually talking to them, asking them, using the athletes as a resource. Um, and I think if you do that, then you, the athletes that are often much smarter than you think, and nobody else can really feel what's going on in their body while doing a good performance or a bad performance. And I think then, if you're able to create a good culture out of that, where you as a coach show that you're interested in learning from them, they will suddenly then start talking to each other, learning from each other. And suddenly you see them out there in the field, they are actually coaching each other. So then you've created a group of people who work together and they are passionate on developing themselves and each other. They work together, they're not hiding any secrets, they're, they're opening up. Um, and I think that's, and that's not only about the training, but also kind of how people are actually asking people kind of, how are you? And getting to know them as persons, you should still kind of have, you shouldn't solve, you shouldn't be a psychologist, but just kind of go getting that close to them that you actually um, see them as humans and not only as athletes. Um, I think that creates something with how you feel at home in the sports, and which is fundamental to to growing uh, passion. And then that's kind of last factor that I see is, of course, you need to give them progress, um, mastery. They need to feel that they're mastering something, they're learning something new, they're getting some progress. That's so of course, if progress stops, and not only we resolve, but at least they have some area where they continuously feel that they are developing. I think that, of course, that grows motivation. Um, but I think that's kind of the three factors I would have lifted up. Right. I like that. Yeah. But I'm not um, a psychologist in this, but it's... No, nice. no, no. It's, that's, that's, that's very good. I think, uh, you know, I think that that, that co-creation with the athletes, you know, to include them in that can be very motivating, right? And then if you're getting better, that, that's very motivating too, right? So, so you have are, some questions. Yeah, I can, you want to read, you can read them even, I think. Yeah, so discuss like, yeah. a little more the question, how did it feel for athletes when training? How can we avoid this suggesting to them that the run or effort was good or bad, but rather how can we more uh, get, get more uh, to learning about uh, Yeah, I think um, I think it's kind of you can of course if kind of if the answer to a run is that it didn't feel good, it was kind of it felt like hell. <laughs> uh, it's kind of uh, you can of course ask follow up questions, kind of, but kind of uh, how does it feel when you have a good run? Um, how is kind of Okay, then, then I can maybe talk about a run that was really good, and then you can ask them again. Uh, but what did you do to make it a good run? Was it any any actions that you 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 did? Uh, was it anything with what you trained the day before, or what did you eat, or 
was it the terrain that you trained in or kind of was it the starting speed so just kind of it might be even you might even link it to something positive um because of course if the, if the run doesn't feel good at all i think if you should take that honestly and try to help the athletes to make a way to get good runs out of it because otherwise it might destroy your motivation uh, over time so i think although you get negative feedback it's kind of it can be used for something positive would be my if that was the answer to the question uh, info i work with our youth alpine athletes aged 10 and under we recently changed our program to open more days in snow than we past years those extra days are a mix of alpine nordic and nordic jumping getting pushed back from parrots on the added time commitment i'd love to know your thoughts on how we talk to parents about the benefits of more time on snow to help their kids with literacy and passion time on snow parents are worried about pushing kids too much at the young age but yeah it's i think um it depends on how you do it i know from the norwegian alpine skiers just that because we don't have so many we have one place to ski on snow in the summer in, for alpine um, and then there was a period when lots of lots of young kids were going to middle europe to ski on snow in the summer uh, and then i i remember that the ski federation really tried to stop that because they thought that you waste so much time in the bus that you should rather develop kind of basic skills at home um but then on the other hand it's kind of when it's snow in norway and it's winter then you should play play on snow and develop your skills and so that was it's, it's always a balance there it can go too far uh so this is just my general idea that of course pushing to small kids traveling around with them all over the place and sitting in on the bus for hours of hours um, to get on snow then of course you need to think to, is it really worth it or could you kind of build basic skills and spend the time a little bit different and then rather spend the time on snow when there is no because then you should utilize the possibilities um, uh, but I, but I, of course if you want to be a good skier you need to ski uh, you need to learn them to ski and and it's kind of finding the balance where it's done in a way that um, that their passion grows and their skill set uh, is developing and, and it's it's both fun and they love something but how to talk to parents is yeah i'm a parent myself but <laughs> it's um i think of, of course with kids i i had a I can go back to this club when I used an example from when we I could, was coaching the kids 20 years ago. The head of that club, he was a former professional cyclist. Um, and he said to me that he was, when he was, um, they had only 10 skiers, I think, when they began. And then they ended up with 200. It's, a, it's a quite a small club in Trondheim where I come from. <laughs> they started with 10 and ended up with 200 in five years. And then he said that, um, I'll start with the parents, and then I only have 10 kids when I start. I, I'll, I don't focus on the kids either. I'll focus on the parents. Okay, what do you mean by that? Because, you know, if you want kids to ski, we need to make the parents happy. We make kind of good information for the parents. We learn the parents to ski, because if they think it's fun to ski, they will come to the training sessions, they bring their kids and they have their own skis and they make a ski tour themselves and we give them technique courses. We'll, we'll teach them a little bit about training and nutrition. So we are, it might facilitate that they help the kids to also eat, eat enough and good food and, and, and help them to balance their, their life outside training. Uh, and then we'll have some nice parties for the at least once or twice a year. We'll make sure that we have fun. It, it should be fun to be part of our club. Um, and then, so that's number one. Then number two, let's educate our coaches. Because if we, we can't pay the coaches too much, we don't can't give them much salary. So it's a lot of volunteer stuff. But at least we'll, we'll make, um, we're bringing some experts who can teach them technique, who can help them to develop. So they feel that when they're part of this club, they are continuously developing as coaches. And then they said, okay, if we have motivated parents, they feel involved in the process, they have given feedback to 
what we're doing and they understand kind of how we work and I think this is really cool. They bring the kids. If we have good coaches who are motivated and doing this in a good way, it will be good sessions. And the effect will be that the kids will develop, the kids will have fun with motivated parents and coaches. And, and uh, I think the consequences that we'll at some point get good skiers out of it. So I think it's kind of, it's just kind of building that culture, of course, involves parents. Um, and also learning the parents, what are their role and what are the coaches' role and how can we play together to help these kids um, developing in a healthy way. I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, it was more reflections around it. Ooh, how many hours a week are ideal? <laughs> Well, as a researcher, I, I normally say that the most important answer to the question is, it depends. <laughs> but uh, I think it's very diff many different pathways to success. Kids are differently mature, differently motivated. You've seen 10-year-olds who are inactive becoming world champions. Um, and using 10 year olds who are training 20 hours a week who kind of quit when they're 15. So it's, um, but in, in general, I think they're probably doing multi sports at this ages anyway. So it's kind of finding a balance. I think they should at least have one or two days a week when they are not organized, uh, where they can play and be kids. Um, and, um, and then trying to find a way to to um, to uh, have good sessions, but also help them to find a good balance of what sports are they doing. If they're doing kind of uh, cross country and soccer, and of course, maybe if you have two organized soccer practices a week, motivate the parents to take them out skiing in the weekend as well, uh, a couple of times. Um, I think that's how you can involve the parents because it's probably not enough for a 10 year old to ski once or twice a week. Um, but if they are kind of going one time cross country skiing and one time alpine skiing in, in the weekend, then they develop with their parents, then they, they develop so much more. Um, it's kind of, I think that's kind of the unorganized playful time on snow is um, probably is probably as important as the organized session. So kind of, it, it's hard to say kind of a number of hours because it's kind of the unorganized part of it should be. I would probably say that the, the good endurance athletes in Alpine skiers, so they probably are 20 hours a week in activity uh, as kids. But 80, 90% is unorganized. Um, probably take away their iPad and mobile phones for a while and send them out in the snow. You know, even something just for some context, I think, on some of these questions is at these younger, younger ages, a couple, we did add some more days to the programming for these younger kids in, in the winter. But we remove some of um, yeah. some days in the like we remove some dry land days so that those kids can play soccer. So philosophically, yeah. the idea was so when there's snow here, ski, right? And then when there's when there's when there's not snow, then do those other sports to have that broad sport sampling. And then the other reason for more in the winter was the coaches were observing um, anecdotally that the kids who um, had that addition were opting for that second or third training day at these ages were progressing and the ones who weren't um, were not progressing. So our concern was that those kids won't be motivated and won't con and won't continue to continue to enjoy the sport because they're not progressing. That's the philosophy behind it. But I think you make a good point. If you don't explain that to the parents well and bring them in, then there's, then they think it's maybe burnout or something happening. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of like, for me, it's, it, it's sometimes difficult to speak to people in a different system because kind of in Norway, we have a very volunteer-based coach system. Uh, we as parents are coaching the kids. But then, of course, if you look at kind of 
the cross country club in Trondheim where my kids are. Um, I think we have four Olympic champions uh, in the coaching team of the kids from six to 12. Um, and we have kind of three professors in sports science. Also. In Trondheim, there we have lots of kind of well educated and, and high level kind of people, and also some nas former national team coaches who are, are involved as, you know. But, and it's a big club where we have lots of lots of kids, um, which is very different to my home club in where I come from originally, where kind of my parents were coaching me and us, and they kind of didn't have so much experience. <laughs> so it's kind of it's a little bit, it's very different from where we are. And, and if you have a more professional system, and if most parents, because where I come from, live now, it's almost all parents who are there, they have been previous skiers. So they they bring their kids to ski in the weekend and they know basic technique and it's kind of, but in other places in Norway, it's, the parents don't have a clue about skiing. So it's, yeah, it's not easy to give you, it depends a little bit. And Oivind, I just want to be respectful of your time. And just for everyone, too, we are doing a, a second session with Oivind next week, Wednesday, the same time, with the specific purpose of discussing, having questions and discussing some more of this. So um, I'm not sure how much time you have tonight, Oivind. I want to be respectful of that because we will have an opportunity for this next week. So I'll let you um, let us know what uh, what works for you. Yeah, no, but uh, I can take note. There will come some extra questions. I can take note of those. and. Uh... We can go dig a bit deeper into them next week. That'd be great. I think we could sort of organize some of these around some themes maybe, and I can um, maybe uh, compile some questions just to send to you to have be prepared to, to talk about them a bit as well. Because I think some of them are in the same, the same vein, I think that I see here. And that, that could be one topic that uh, maybe you could be a little bit prepared to discuss um, next week as well. Yeah. 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 And I see some good questions there on kind of, competitions and keeping track of results etc and uh, I can just answer that last one that it's that's the rule that we don't kind of keep track of rankings you I think that the kids that can from the age of 9 12 or something they they can get their own result because of course they want their kids are smart they want to get the result but you don't make ranking lists of it and you don't kind of put them on the podium and it's kind of they, and you don't put them on a, when you give them the results, they, they are not ranked kind of first, second, third place. They just get their own result. And, and, and the reason for it is not that it's dangerous to give them the results. It's just that you, you just want to put focus on the process and what they learn um, uh, instead of just kind of getting their results. And that's the only focus. And ma mainly it's the problem is that uh, is the parents because they are most interested in in results, but of course there are cases where this is people deviate from the rules for them. Yeah. At least I've seen that it's. I sometimes want to take the results away from other athletes as well because they're so focused on results that it's impossible to get them to kind of really dig into what is the process of development. <laughs> but uh, yeah. No, well, but um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Good. Yeah, I hope you got something out of it. Um, and then uh, I'll see you next week. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this. This is awesome. Um, great information and packaged very well. So, uh, very applicable to what we do here. So, thanks a lot. And we'll see you next week. Have a good night. Have a good night. Too. Bye.